This quote is from a poster I used to have at work. A visitor once saw it and said, a true Vikings fan wouldn't have something like that. I replied, only a true Vikings fan would understand it. The Vikings are the undisputed kings of Minnesota sports heartbreak. We were the first team to lose four Super Bowls. We've all covered our eyes when the Vikings line up for a field goal, or got that feeling in the pit of our stomachs when they start to blow a fourth quarter lead. And Minnesotans know exactly what I'm talking about, because they've lived it. It's a shared experience. It's a here we go again mentality. Being a Vikings fan requires a thicker skin, and is definitely not for the faint of heart. Have you ever noticed that other teams' highlights are always against the Vikings? This is from 1988. It was third and two from the Vikings' 49-yard line. At this point, the Vikings were up by four points with under two minutes left. Remember this one? Dallas running back Tony Dorsett ran for a record 99-yard touchdown against the Vikings. What's worse? The Cowboys only had 10 men on the field. Speed, 99 yards and a half. Dorsett down the sideline. Stays in bounds. Can you believe that? Just try looking up Barry Sanders' highlights. Who do you think most of those will be against? Run. Full speed left. Hurt. Stop. Hurt. Go. You're not going to attack one. Forget it. Let's address the elephant in the room. I'm often accused of being overly superstitious, but you can't tell me it's a good omen when a balloon carrying your mascot crashes in the pregame ceremony of your first Super Bowl. Fans in the stands began fleeing for their lives. The balloon then crashed in the lower deck. The Vikings were considered the best team in both leagues and were favored by 12 points. Kansas City head coach Hank Stram orchestrated a masterpiece on both sides of the ball in what is considered one of the greatest upsets in NFL history. Larry Zonka and the Dolphins ran for a combined 196 yards on our Purple People Eaters in Super Bowl VIII. Bob Greasy only threw seven passes in this game. So take me back, so take me back to the good old day. Not only did the Steel Curtain defense hold the Vikings to 17 rushing yards, but five turnovers were the story for the Vikings in Super Bowl IX. To the burdens we would shoulder struggles we would find but growing may us strong as strong can be in super bowl 11 the raiders rushed for a record 266 yards Those were the time. for his greatest tarkington was he only threw one touchdown pass in the three super bowls he played in and once again, turnovers would be the difference in the game. There's another little quick flip. Look out. There, there he is. goes. Goodbye. Grabbed off. Willie Brown on Goodbye. his way. Goodbye, Willie Brown, Willie. the veteran. He the waited line. for that one. 14 oh. years, Willie's waited. Those were the times. Those four Super Bowl losses have really messed with our heads. Our obsession with getting back there and the misfortune involved has caused a sort of fatalism to develop in many of us. Always assuming the worst is going to happen. In December 1975, the Vikings suffered what might be considered their first heartbreak trying to get back to the Super Bowl. With the Vikings leading 14-10 and just under 30 seconds left in the divisional playoff, Cowboys quarterback Roger Staubach threw a deep pass to Drew Pearson. Pearson pushed down Vikings defender Nate Wright to catch the game-winning touchdown and propel the Cowboys to the NFC Championship. Now let's watch the play by Pearson here. He's very well covered at this point. Looks like almost an interception. You see him coming back right there to make the catch. Nate Wright falls down. And by the way, that's not a flag. Someone threw an orange peel. Someone also threw a whiskey bottle at the referee. After the game, Staubach said he just threw up a prayer, 
and the term Hail Mary was born. In 1987, the Vikings backed into a wildcard spot with an 8-7 record. But they went on a playoff run, upsetting the Saints and the 49ers, only to have it end at the goal line in the NFC Championship. On fourth down, behind by seven with 56 seconds left, Darren Nelson dropped a pass from Wade Wilson at the goal line that could have tied the game. There may have been some confusion on the play though. Vikings receiver Anthony Carter was right behind Nelson. And then there's 1998. And Anderson hasn't missed in two years. So that's a pretty good bet if you say, do you think Gary Anderson will make this field goal? The answer should probably be yes. 39 yards away. And it's not good. Everyone remembers Anderson's miss, but we often forget that the Vikings took a knee and played for overtime. The Vikings had one of the best offenses in the entire history of the NFL that year, and we took a knee to play for overtime. Still makes me angry. I don't even know what to say about this one. I'm pretty sure our team showed up. Remember 12 men in the huddle? I bet the name Tahi is popping into your head right now. The truth is, that wasn't Tahi's fault. Brad Childress changed the play at the last second, after a timeout, causing the penalty. And then the interception happened. Brett Favre goes back to pass, he pumps. Now he fires over the middle, intercepted. I can't believe what I'm seeing right now. And eventually we learned about Bounty Gate. And don't forget the Cardinals' 4th and 25 last second touchdown, knocking the Vikings out of playoff contention in 2003. Get back, guys. Here it is. The season's on the line. Two receivers left and right. McCown takes the snap. He steps up. He's all by himself. Fires into the end zone. Caught! Touchdown! No! No! The Cardinals have knocked the Vikings out of the playoffs! In 2016, Blair Walsh missed this potential game-winning kick versus Seattle. McDermott is the snapper. And the kick is no good! We've all seen the viral videos of people losing their minds during the Minneapolis Miracle. My reaction was a little different. I got so worked up watching us blow that 17-point lead that I got sick and had to go outside. This is actual footage from my doorbell camera after we won. I felt like we had just escaped death and it would come looking for payment. And wouldn't you know it, death came calling the following week. And just when we thought it was safe to believe again. Did you know that the Green Bay Packers almost left the NFL? Their first season in the league was 1921. Their first game was against the Minneapolis Marines. That game was considered to be a litmus test to see if they were going to continue playing in the professional league. The Marines scored first on a three-yard plunge by Ben Dvorak, but Eber Sampson missed the kick. Minneapolis held that 6 to nothing lead for three quarters, but near the end of the game, the Packers scored to tie it up, and Curly Lambeau kicked the game-winning extra point. Yes, that Curly Lambeau. According to some historians, had the Marines won that game, the Packers may not have continued in the league. You heard that right. A Minnesota football team had the chance to get rid of the Packers, and not only did they fail, it was because of a kicker. How Minnesota sports is that? As long as we're already talking about kickers, let's open a vein. Gary Anderson wasn't the first Vikings kicker to miss a crucial field goal, but that miss sure seems like a seminal moment in our modern era of field goal follies. When Anderson's contract expired in 2002, the Vikings decided not to resign him because he couldn't do kickoffs and signed Doug Bryan instead. In Bryan's second game, he missed two extra points, which led to the game going to overtime and the Vikings lost. And on his way home from the game, head coach Mike Tice called into a radio fan line show to rip on his own kicker. A few days later, Gary Anderson was brought back in, and Brian was eventually released. In the sixth round of the 2012 NFL Draft, 
Vikings GM Rick Spielman selected kicker Blair Walsh. Walsh's field goal accuracy in his senior season at Georgia was only 60%, but Spielman felt he had a strong leg. Walsh did well his first season as a Viking. He led the league in field goals made and hit a 56-yard field goal that tied a team record. In 2014, Walsh finished the season as one of the NFL's least accurate kickers. Despite that, the Vikings gave him a four-year contract extension that summer. We all know how that season ended, but his struggles continued into the 2016 season. After missing an extra point to the Redskins, Walsh was released and replaced by Kai Forbath. A year after drafting Walsh, Spielman drafted punter Jeff Locke in the fifth round. At that time, only nine punters had been drafted. Ever. Six years to the exact day of drafting Blair Walsh, the Vikings drafted another kicker, Daniel Carlson, this time in the fifth round. Less than 20 kickers have been drafted in the fifth round or higher since 2000. According to 538's Michael Salfino, a fifth round pick for a kicker is more like a first rounder for any other position. Carlson lasted two games. He was cut after missing three field goals in a game with the Packers that ended in a tie. The Vikings signed veteran kicker Dan Bailey. Bailey was statistically one of the most accurate kickers in NFL history. So you would think the Vikings finally had their man, right? During training camp the next year, the Vikings traded a fifth round pick to the Ravens for kicker Corey Vedvik. So essentially it was like drafting another kicker with a fifth round pick. And then the Vikings cut him three weeks later. The Vikings have had their fair share of scandal as well. Remember this old TV show? Love, exciting and new. Come That's not the image Vikings fans get in their head when they hear the phrase, love boat. In 2003, the Vikings signed free agent corner Fred Smoot. Ironically, it was the same exact day that rumors started to surface about head coach Mike Tice's ticket scalping scandal. Tice would eventually be fined $100,000 for selling Super Bowl tickets. Let's get back to Fred Smoot. I'm not sure I should call him the captain or the activities director, but that year, Smoot was in charge of the team's bye week rookie party. On October 6, 2005, Vikings players set sail on Lake Minnetonka with exotic dancers flown in from around the country on a boat ironically named Mischievous and had a party that would make Hugh Hefner blush. That is a disgusting act. The Vikings were in the midst of a push for a new stadium, and owner Ziggy Wilf was said to be extremely upset. Speaking of dinghies, ever hear of a Wizenator? Neither had I until 2005 when Vikings running back Ontario Smith was busted with one at the airport. Apparently it's a prosthetic limb that helps players trick drug testing officials with fake urine. It's so famous, a bar in Mankato purchased Smith's Wizenator and put it on display to attract business. In October 1989, Vikings general manager Mike Lynn traded what he thought were five players and a first, second, and sixth round pick to Dallas in exchange for running back Herschel Walker. What Lynn didn't know was that newly hired Dallas coach Jimmy Johnson had no intention of keeping the players. Johnson knew he could get more of the Vikings draft picks by cutting the players. It would eventually become the biggest trade in the history of the NFL, and Johnson declared that he had just committed the great train robbery. All said and done, Johnson got eight of the Vikings draft picks and used them to rebuild the Cowboys into a dynasty, and they won three Super Bowls in the 90s. I don't know about you, but I've had about enough of Dallas. As long as we're talking about draft picks, let's look at some of the other head scratchers too. In the 1982 draft, the Vikings selected Disco Darren Nelson. Nelson wanted nothing to do with Minnesota. As a matter of fact, he wrote the Vikings a letter asking them not to draft him because he didn't feel Minnesota fit his disco lifestyle. A reporter asked him if he thought that Minnesota didn't have discos, and Nelson replied that he didn't want to go to a disco and listen to country music. 
And not only did we draft Nelson when he didn't want to come here, we drafted him ahead of future Hall of Famer Marcus Allen, who was chosen three picks later. Oh, and there's this. In April 2003, the Vikings were slotted to have the number seven overall pick. But they failed to get their card to the podium in time and ended up picking ninth after Jacksonville and Carolina quickly took advantage of the Vikings' mistake. Apparently, the Vikings were trying to trade with Baltimore, but in the words of Ravens GM Ozzie Newsom, the trade was never consummated. I think that means we got screwed. The Vikings claim they got the player they wanted anyways in Kevin Williams. But we most likely lost some extra draft picks by not trading down. In 2005, the Vikings used a first-round pick on wide receiver Troy Williamson in an attempt to replace the recently traded Randy Moss. They also had another pick in that round. At number 18, they selected defensive end Erasmus James. Oh yeah, and this guy went at number 24. Back to Williamson, the guy that was going to replace Randy Moss. He was fast, but he couldn't catch. Justin Taylor and Tony Richardson in the backfield. Tavares Jackson with time, puts it up deep, he's got a man wide open, and Williamson dropped it! Troy Williamson dropped it! He was... The Vikings thought it was a vision problem and sent him to see specialists at Nike. Yeah, that makes sense. In 2011, the Vikings used the 11th overall pick on Christian Ponder. But by far the strangest draft pick situation the Vikings ever had was in 1999. They selected Demetrius Underwood after his coaches at Michigan State warned them not to. After Underwood signed his contract, he walked out of practice the next day and didn't return. He said he was struggling to resolve the conflict between football and his faith. The Vikings released him and he forfeited most of his bonus. On a final draft related note, when quarterback Teddy Bridgewater was severely injured at training camp prior to the 2016 season, the Vikings traded with the Philadelphia Eagles for quarterback Sam Bradford, giving up some draft picks, including a first rounder in 2017. The Eagles used that pick to draft defensive end Derek Barnett. In the 2018 NFC Championship game, that very same Derek Barnett had a strip sack on Vikings quarterback Case Keenum, causing a turnover and giving the Eagles momentum. Philadelphia never looked back, and we all know what happened after that. And now we've come full circle, but that's got me feeling like I need to go back on my front steps again. By the way, did our visiting fans really have to dress Rocky in purple? For a team like ours, with bad demons to begin with, that's just asking for it. Especially from a fan base that has a reputation for being a little riled up. Raise your hands And you know that it's true I got nothing to lose And I know I'm not cool So what have we learned? Although Minnesota sports continue to be tortured, so is Cleveland. It's like we're kindred spirits in some sort of weird cosmic universe of disappointment. Whether he's to blame or not, we've learned that Norm will always suck. We've learned that the NBA draft lottery is rigged. After doing some math, we learned that the Twins are about due for another championship. But we also learned that revenue sharing just doesn't add up. We've learned that kickers should be banned, and the NFL should only allow teams to go for two. Okay, well, at least stop drafting kickers. Please. We've learned that it's not all bad. Minnesota's had some success, and we're proud of the championships that we do have. The Minneapolis Lakers won six championships in the 40s and 50s, even though Google still won't acknowledge that they were won in Minneapolis. The Minnesota Twins have won the World Series twice, and the women's teams in Minnesota have somehow avoided the curse. And not only that, the Minnesota Lynx are tied for the most championships in the history of the WNBA. And lastly, we've learned that Minnesota fans are unconditionally loyal, but also have a good sense of humor about our misfortune. So where does that leave us? 
Our hope in creating this film was to exercise our demons. The Believe Land documentary had a happy ending. Will this one? Just made a great play. Took the, baked the guy on the outside, stepped inside him, and uh, made the block. It was uh, a hell of a uh, game. I mean, I mean, uh, for 23 bucks, if you can get more excitement than that, uh, hell, you're in the wrong uh, operation. It was a hell of a hell of a game. And let me say something. As long as I'm in this job, Snelker will be the offensive coach. I mean, no, no question about that. No, no, no question about that. Now, we, uh, I don't like to name names after a f***ing, after a f***ing game, but we, we can't, we can't be responsible for the blocking, we can't be responsible for the f***ing guys jumping offside, we can't be responsible for, f***ing. we get down there and, and, uh, and it was a dumb play by, by Anderson, I love, I love Anderson, but it was a dumb f***ing play when he had, when his foot was, uh, shoe was coming off, up the line screen, we were hard and take time out, we had a f***ing trap play called, and, and, he, and his f***ing shoe comes off. That, 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 ain't, that ain't Bob Schnelker's fault. We have another f***ing trap play, and if, and if, if any picks up his f***ing feet, he walks in. We got the f***ing pass to uh, 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 AC out there in the flat. And the ball's thrown in the, uh, low. That, ain't, that isn't Schnelker's fault. We got right down there, we got, we got the second down, and, and I don't know what the hell, two, two yards ago, I don't know what, 15, 40, whatever the hell it was, and, uh, and Irwin uh, uh, jumps offside. Now, I, uh, these are the things that have been hurting us all along, the little things. We're working at them to stop them. We moved the ball good today. We went down there, and we didn't get the ball in the end zone. I think we did, yeah. <laughs> Anything else? Well, just before you No, you will we'll, we'll steer one up. We'll steer one up here before it's done. You know, we he did a sensational job. Kicked seven, seven uh, uh, field goals. He, he can win a game many ways, many ways. But uh, uh, DJ, I, I, I was uh, happy when they kicked the ball to him. Yeah, last week we get on the Giants. Christ, he ran 65 yards. This time he fumbles the ball. What the hell? What the hell can you do? You can't, uh, 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 you, all you do is you prepare as thoroughly as you can. The guys play their asses off. Any other questions? The guy feel like afterwards, what? Yeah, yeah, he felt like, he felt like afterwards. Everybody booed him, he worked his ass off. And, he, and he, no smarter uh, uh, coordinator in football. They put his picture up there and the f***ers boo him.